Well, good morning and welcome to Stevens Creek Church. We're so glad that you're here today. I'd like to welcome all those in our South Campus, those in our Grovetown Campus, those watching online and on demand, those watching in our atrium. Uh, we're definitely a church scattered across this community. I'll tell you, it's a, it's a great day to be here. A little brisk, a little cold outside, but that's all right too. You know, sometimes we start the new year and we just kind of run through the embracing the new year without pausing for a couple of minutes and just talking about what took place just the weeks prior. I'll tell you, Christmas at the Creek this year was amazing. And I don't know if you were at our Christmas Eve service, but it was something, um, it was next level. Uh, Todd and the music team, they're just incredible. We didn't set a record this year, but, but uh, it was a good show. We had 4,240 people. Uh, come to our Christmas services, and so that's pretty good. You know, and I'll tell you, on uh, Friday night, the 23rd, uh, it was so cold, and uh, we lost power, a tree fell on, and Georgia Power working all day, so it was like, it was something else, but people, you were so kind, we started 40 minutes late, I, the first people started showing up, and it was all dark. I'm telling you, it, was, it was one of those things. But there's something about power poles. This morning, over, um, over during the night today, there was a power pole at our South Campus that had some issues. Take a look at this picture from South Campus today. So what is it with Stevens Creek and power poles over the last three weeks? But uh, we're, we're hoping that maybe they'll have enough power south. I hope you're okay. Uh, but there's some work that needs to be done. Of course, tomorrow's a holiday, so it's not going to be tomorrow. Uh, but interesting. We're glad to have you here. You know, I like to start with something funny. Did you hear about the, the pastor received a phone call from a church member and said, Hey, pastor, said, I need you to come over. He said, My dog died, and I need you to come over to my house and do a funeral. He said, Nah, <laughs> nah. I, I don't do funerals for dogs. He said, Well, I was thinking about donating $5,000 to the building fund. He said, well, why didn't you tell me your dog was Baptist? <laughs> well, today we're starting a brand, uh, we're continuing our series called Your Story Matters. And as we learned last week that, you know, we, all of us have stories that we love to tell, stories that, that we're proud of. And we talk about those stories. Remember the time I did this? Remember the time you overcame this? Remember, oh, this was something funny that happened in my life. I can't believe I did that. And we tell those stories. But on the other hand, all of us have sections or maybe entire chapters of our story that no, we wish that nobody would ever find out. All of us have struggles. All of us have a story. And so when we think about that, our story, all of us have a past, and we cannot rewrite our past, but we can today to start to rewrite, uh, to write a new future. And the big idea for this series is this, the decisions that you make today will determine the stories that you tell tomorrow. The decisions that you make today. And so last week we started this off, said we decided to start, and we talked about starting disciplines and doing things that will impact our stories in the future. And today we're looking at uh, this statement, I decided to stop. We're looking at some things that we're going to stop doing. And every week we're going to base this on stories from the Bible. Today's story is going to be about the life of Moses and specifically a time when he uh, had a conversation with his father-in-law, Jethro. Now, I shared this story this past summer but I want to revisit it because I really feel like it, it speaks specifically to the subject matter of today. Now, what do we know about Moses? We know that Moses was one of the greatest leaders of all time. We know that he led the children of Israel out of slavery from Egypt. He was the guy that was called up to go to Mount Sinai and receive the Ten Commandments. We also know that he led the, the children of Israel through the wilderness towards the promised land. Moses was an incredible leader. But there, he was an overachiever, and he accomplished more than most of us would ever dream about. But there came a point in his life when Moses felt overwhelmed by his circumstances. 
that he felt that he just couldn't get it all done. Have you ever been there? Have, have you ever been in a place where it was like you're just overwhelmed with everything? And maybe you're in school, you're overwhelmed with the pre- papers you have to write, the, the tests you have to prepare for, or maybe at home you've got all these things. You're just overwhelmed with all this stuff to do. If you have ever felt overwhelmed by the events and the things of your life, then you can relate to Moses. He felt overwhelmed. He felt like he couldn't get it all done. And at this point, his problems wore on his emotional being and his physical being, and he just felt worn out by all the problems that people brought to him because he took the responsibility of helping them figure out and judging over the people. And one day, his, son, uh, his father-in-law, Jethro, came and spoke to him and said, Moses, let me talk to you. You got to stop it. You got to stop it. You got to stop doing all of this. He said in Exodus chapter 18 and verse 17, he said, What you are doing, Moses, is not good. Now, let me ask you, those in our atrium today, what if somebody were to come up to you and say that, hey, what you're doing is not good? How would you respond to that? How would you respond if somebody were to come up to you and say, hey, look, I've been watching you, and, and you know, you're going down the wrong path. What you're doing is not good. I mean, this habit you, that you've developed, or, or you've got this mindset, or this addictive um, personality, or this addiction you have, or maybe you've got this attitude, or this thought process, or, or something in your life. It's just not good for you. And if you continue to go down this path, it's going to write a story that you're not going to be proud of. What if somebody came up to you and said that? Would you be able to receive that? Jethro goes the next step in verse 18. He says, you and all these people who come to you, will notice this, will wear yourselves out. The work is just too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Now listen to me, Moses. Jethro was saying this. I'm going to give you some advice, and may God be with you. And so Jethro started to say, I I think you need to divide the people up into divisions. And you need to delegate authority and put people over thousands and put people over hundreds and put people over fifties and put people over small groups and groups of ten. And you need to explain, uh, you need to delegate the authority and you need to tell the people when they have a problem, go to their small group leader and then go to the next level to their divisional leader and so forth and let them handle the issues, but you... Moses, deal with only the issues that they cannot handle. And he goes on to say, if you do this, this will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to notice this word. You will be able to stand the strain. Stand the strain. There are some of you that are stressed out and you're overwhelmed and you're filled with anxiety and you don't know how long you can stand it anymore. That's how Moses was. And he said, Jethro said, if you do this, you can stand the strain and notice that all the people are going to go home and they're going to be satisfied. Now, the good news is Moses listened to his father-in-law And he did everything he said, and Moses actually stopped trying to do a lot of things. And that's what we're talking about here, and that's why we're talking about him. Moses decided to stop. Here's what I want you to do. Listen to me. I want you to quit doing something. Yeah, today. I want you to quit doing something. South Campus, hear me. I want you to quit doing something. Grovetown Campus, I want you to quit doing something. Bob Goff is one of the uh, famous Christian authors. He's written a lot of books like Love Does, Everybody Always, and so forth. But he has this saying. He said, 
every Thursday I quit doing something. Anybody can quit doing something on a Thursday. And I thought about that. Okay, I can quit doing something on a Thursday. So what are you? What are you going to quit? Maybe not Thursday, but what are you going to quit doing today? This is a real question. This is not one of those leading. This is, I want you to think about that. Just for a moment, what are you going to quit doing? Because you are overloaded with stuff. And you cannot stand the strain any longer. You need to release some of the stuff. You need to quit doing something. So what are you going to stop doing to make your life better? What are you going to do to make your load lighter? I want you to think of one thing. There's just one thing and only one thing today. Just one thing that's not good in your life. And then today, at the the conclusion of this service, we're going to ask God, God, would you help me stop doing this one thing? Now, some of you said, oh, Marty said, I've tried to quit before. I just can't do it. Well, if that's you, your story sounds like the story of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is a pretty famous guy. He wrote probably 20% of the New Testament, half the books in the New Testament. And he's pretty famous because you think about it, in our culture today, 2,000 years later, there's churches named after him, there's um, universities named after him, there's hospitals named after St. Paul. There's even 18 cities in America named after St. Paul. 18 cities. St. Paul, South Carolina, about 100 miles from here. So this guy seems to be... He's got it all together. In fact, since he carries the name St. Paul, now he didn't name himself that, but culture did, but you'd think that he was pretty kind of like a perfect kind of guy, but he was not. Paul had struggles, and he really struggled, but he didn't hide behind his struggles. St. Paul just aired them. He just let everybody know that he was struggling. He actually wrote it down so that we have some of his writings. In one letter, he said in Romans chapter 7, he said, I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do that anyway. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. He said, oh, I love God's law with all my heart, but notice this, there is another power within me. That is at war with my mind. Paul is saying, I am struggling in my mind. I've got these negative thoughts in my mind. There is another power at work in me, and it's warring against my thoughts. It's warring against my mind. And that power makes me a slave, a slave to sin that is still within me. And what Paul is doing as he is writing this, he's just coming clean. He's just saying, look, my life has become unmanageable, and I need help. My life has become unmanageable, and I need a power that is greater than myself. He goes on to say in verse 24, he said, oh, what a miserable person I am. What a miserable person I am. Who will... Free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death. So he's asking this question, where can I find freedom? Then he answers his his own question in the very next verse, and he says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the answer. The power of Jesus. He is the power that is greater than yourselves. Many of you have set goals for the new year. You've established resolutions. Oftentimes, our resolutions fail because we rely too much on our willpower instead of relying on God's power. We quote the verse and said, oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we put that out there. But then when we start to live it out, we take the two words through Christ out of the verse. I can do this. I can do this, I can do this, and we convince ourselves we can do it without Christ, but we can't. 
And we've got to be honest today. All of us struggle. And some of us wrestle with food. Some of us wrestle with alcohol. Some of us wrestle with uh, drugs. Some of us wrestle with insecurities, anxieties, uh, pornography. I mean, the list goes on and on. And that's why we're praying during this 21 days of prayer, God, get the junk out of our lives and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a Bible word that describes that, get the junk out of your life. The Bible word that, um, that describes that is the word sanctification. So we're actually saying, God, sanctify me. The Apostle Paul said, man, every day, God, I need to be sanctified, so help me every day. Get the junk out of my life. Give me a breakthrough. God set me free from addictions. This is MLK weekend, and and he often, MLK often talked about being free, and that's what I want for you. I want you to be spiritually free, and that's why we're praying over you every day. It's so interesting, and these are just some hand-picked prayer cards that you turned in. Uh, These are from Grovetown campus. These are from South campus and from here, and I was just going through these. And it, it is uh, something, God, help me with uh, alcohol, addictions. Uh, I need true healing and uh, alcohol abuse. Uh, homosexuality, remain sober. Homosexuality, healing, uh, cuts herself, alcoholism, addiction, addiction, drinking, alcohol, addiction, stop drinking, addiction, 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 alcohol. I could go, this is us. These are creakers. We're not talking about somebody way out there. The struggle is real. And over and over, we have been praying for God to come and set you free. Over and over, God healed me. God helped me. Over and over. And some of you didn't even turn in a card. But there's one on the back of your seat that you can fill out and drop it on, your, on the stage at the conclusion of the service, and we'll pray over you tomorrow. What's the one thing you need to stop doing? What is that one thing what is it? Is it food? Is it alcohol? Is it, is it pornography? What is that one thing? Now, a lot of us, it's very evident what we need to stop. But there's a whole group of people that it's not evident. You just keep that, that life hidden, and it's just you. Just because it is not visible does not mean that it's not a problem. Some of the problems that we have, we keep hidden. But God sees those problems, and he wants to help. He wants to help. And you keep telling yourself it's not a problem. You keep telling yourself you can quit any time. But each and every day, it's like you're giving up more and more control. You don't have to continue to live like this. Hear me. You don't have to continue to live like this. Today is the day that you can be set free. Today is the day that you can start on a new path. And I'll tell you, the decisions that you make today will determine the stories that you tell in the future. I want to share three biblical principles that I believe will be very practical that will help you take your next step toward freedom today. And at the conclusion of this service, we're going to pray with you in specific prayers. We're going to pray a general prayer, but we're going to pray specific prayers where if you want to come forward, that we will pray over you specifically. But there's three steps. First of all, I want you to take it to God. I want you to take it to God. Now, the it may be different for most of us here. Whatever it is to you, whatever that thing is, whatever that baggage is, whatever that problem is, whatever that addiction is, we're going to take it to God. 
Romans chapter 6 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments to wickedness. But notice this, notice this. But rather offer yourselves to God. Offer yourself, God, I am giving you my life. Offer yourselves to God. Give it over to God. Surrender this to the Lord. Offer yourselves to God for sin shall not be your master. Offer yourselves to God for sin shall not be your master. Today, I want you to be honest. I want you to admit it. I want you to come clean. I think the very first step is to admit that you have a problem and you need to come clean. That's when you say, I'm not going to live like this anymore. You make that decision. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to live in this darkness anymore. I'm not going to allow this darkness to control my body. I am just not going to go there. I am going to take it to God. And I believe that when you're serious about this and you're serious and you take it to God, like you've never done before, I just, you're going to find help. Now, I'm not talking about some sterile kind of a Sunday school kind of a prayer. I am talking about a prayer that comes out of a desperate spirit, a desperation. My, my, my little grandma used to say, oh, you need to hold on to the horns of the altar. And I thought, really, what's that? And she was doing this Old Testament reference. And what she was saying is, you need to get serious. And you need to say, God, I'm not going to leave this place until I know you've heard my prayer. I'm not going to leave this place until I know you've touched me. I'm not going to leave this place until I know that I've been set free. Because, God, if you don't come through, I'm not going to get out. God, I am desperate here. And if you don't help me, I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. But we come to this place where we cry out to God, God, set me free. When you look at your life and you look at the problems that you have, you look at the addictions that you struggle, and all of us, folks, these are creakers here, this is us, all of us struggle. But look at that struggle and I want you to name the struggle. Name it. And then ask yourself, who is bigger, God or that struggle? God or that addiction? Who's bigger? Who's bigger, God or that? Do you remember the story of David and Goliath? All the Israelites were so scared of Goliath. Oh, he's so big, he's so big, we'll never, he's too big. And David heard that over and over and over to the point where he said, man, I've had all I can stand. Who is this guy think he is that can come against the armies of the living God? And David said, my God is bigger and he will deliver us. Your struggle may look like a giant. It may be looming over you like Goliath was looming over that entire army. But let me say, God is bigger than those giants that are looming over you. He's bigger. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. They have divine power. They have explosive. They have miraculous power. The weapons that you fight with are not like the weapons of everybody else in the culture because you have spiritual power through the name of Jesus You have spiritual power that will break the strongholds, those things that are holding you back, that are keeping you from living up to your potential, that are keeping you enslaved to your past. So what are we going to do today? We're going to take it to God. Here's the second thing. We're going to take it to God, and secondly, we're going to take it public. We're going to confess this publicly. 
We're going to confess this publicly. In James chapter 5 and verse 15, 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you, what, can be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The problem is so many of us are just afraid to admit it. But we need to admit it to God and somebody else. You've got to get past your fear. You're not going to be set free until you admit it publicly. But let me just be very practical. Admitting it publicly does not mean that you're going to post it on Instagram this afternoon or Facebook. Okay? There's certain things that you need to... You need to admit it to a trusted friend. It doesn't need to be blasted all over and you work out all of your emotional baggage online for the world to see. It's just not a good look for you, okay? Just not a good look. There's sometimes I read that, oh, I wouldn't have gone there. And I understand, you know, that you need therapy. But that ain't the place to get it. (laughs) That's just not the place, okay? And so when I talk about take it publicly, I'm saying find that that trusted person. It may be one of the prayer people uh, that will be at the front of the stage at the conclusion of the service that you just tell somebody. Not everybody, okay? Now, when you ask somebody for help, what are you asking? You're asking three things. You're saying, God, will you help me pray? There's something powerful about two people touching one thing. If two shall agree touching one thing, it shall be done. So you're saying, um, I am telling you this so that you will pray for me. So help me with prayer. So we're going to that trusted friend and say, would you help me with prayer? The second thing is, I need you to help me when I fall. Because the chances are that you will fall. Okay? The chances are you're going to fall. And you're, taking, you're, you're talking to this person and said, when, if I fall, will you be there for me? Will you help me? Will you encourage me? And so those of you that have slipped and fallen, would you admit it and reach out to one of your friends and say, can you help me? That's what we're asking. We're going to take it public. It means that well, help me with prayer, help me with a my fall. And the third thing is help me with accountability. You need a friend that will hold you accountable. Do you have somebody that you trust and that loves you enough that you will allow them to confront you when they see that you're veering off and going down the wrong path? Do you have anybody in your life that you're willing to allow them to speak into your life and to confront you? You need that person. You need that person. You need help. You need to confess. Now, some of you today may be on the receiving end of a confession. And I just want you to take a deep breath, and I want you to receive it with grace. Don't get angry. Don't take it personally. Because understand your response to this person's confession is a critical part of the healing process. I want you to love them. I want you to pray for them. I want you to help them and realize that they want to be free. You've got to take it to God, and you're going to take it public. Here's the third thing, very practically, the third thing. I want you to take it down. I want you to take it down. So how are you going to take it down? time for you to do something. What is that? Well, I want you to do what you can do. You're part of this process. You're part of this deliverance. So I want you to do what you can. You do the possible, and then you trust God to do what you can't do. But you do the possible. 
Struggle is alcohol? Okay, go home and pour it out. That's what you can do. You can do that. You can go home and you can pour it, pour it out. Trouble, you have a problem with cigarettes? As you're leaving, just throw it in the trash can, leaving church. That's what you can do. You can throw it away. Now, what you can, I don't need you to stop by the next convenience store and buy another pack. Because <laughs> that's what you'll be tempted. Oh, I need gasoline. Oh, no, that's, that's the wrong voice talking to you. Do what you can do. You do the possible. You do the possible. You've got to take action from that. You've got to boldly say, I am not going to allow sin to master me. Today is the day that I am going to be set free. Today is the day that I am determined. I am going to take it down. I am victorious uh, in Jesus' name. And I mentioned this scripture earlier. And hold on to it. I can do everything through him, through Christ, who gives me strength. Jesus will give you the strength. Jesus will give you the strength. And you can do this. You can do this. You can get past this. But I I need you to make that decision because the decisions that you make today will determine the stories that you tell tomorrow. So in the next few minutes, we're going to prepare our hearts for prayer. We're going to have a, a general prayer here. And then we're going to give an opportunity for specific prayers. And I'm going to pray over you, and there are people here that have never been uh, saved. You've never made that decision to follow Christ. Today is your day to take that step. We had people in our, our earlier service that gave their heart to Jesus today. That's going to be my first prayer. Then we're going to have a second prayer. It's going to be a prayer of deliverance. And it's during that, after, when I say amen that, to, to that prayer, the worship team is going to come around and sing a song, a couple of songs. And if you would like specific prayers prayed over you, you can come forward. If you're in the atrium, you can come in uh, to the auditorium here. If you're in Grove Town, just come to the front. In South Campus, come to the front. And there are going to be people who will pray over you. And if you would like to be anointed with oil... We're going to do that. That's based on this scripture. Is anyone sick? So if you need healing, anybody sick here, not feeling well, if anybody is sick, he should call on the elders of the church to pray over him. We're going to uh, lay hands on you. We're going to pray over you. We're going to anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. This is not some magic wand. We're anointing with oil because oil symbolizes the work of the Holy Spirit. We're also doing that because the Bible is telling us to do that. So this is in faith. And he says, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And if you've sinned, you will be forgiven. So, are you ready? Are you ready to receive from the Lord today? Let's all stand together in Grove Town. South Campus, in the atrium, let's stand together. I want to pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over this wonderful congregation. I pray, Lord, that you would touch them right where they are. Right in the middle of their struggle. Right in the middle of their difficulty. Right in the middle of their sin. God, help us. Forgive us. Heal us. If you've never been saved, I want you to pray with me. Say, Jesus, say that. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Say that. Say, come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. Say that. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I want you to pray this. Say, Jesus, make me into the kind of person that you want me to be. I give you my life. I give you my past. I trust you with my future. Save me. Fill me with your spirit, and I receive what you have for me.
And Father, I pray for those that are in the middle of a struggle, those that are worn out, those that are facing difficulty, those that are addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to food, uh, to anxiety. The list goes on to pornography. The list just goes on and on and on. I pray, Lord, that this day would be a day of healing, that this day would be a day of deliverance. And, Lord, as we lay hands, God, that you would meet them in the struggle, meet them in this moment. So we are praying in faith in Jesus' name. Amen.